My name is Jamie Dorley. I'm CEO and co-founder of Nutritional Frontiers, along with Dr. James Weiner. I want to thank everyone for coming to our professional training event today. Appreciate you guys coming out and taking a Saturday. I know our time is very important. The time is very short, as we learned this year. So I thank everyone. Nutritional Frontiers turned 10 on May 8th this year. So thank you very much. We started the company along with the late, great Dr. James Weiner, as everyone knows, unfortunately he passed away last year. So in memory of Dr. Weiner, I say that, you know, he created the uh, legacy and the responsibility now on us to take what he created and not only continue it, but make it bigger and better. So contrary to popular uh, beliefs among some people, Nutritional Frontiers is not going anywhere except for up. And that's uh, going to be behind my leadership. I'm taking over the company 100%. And anybody you see in the back, everyone put their hands up. That is my team and family, literally at Nutritional Frontiers, including the local rep, Mike Gallagher. Everyone know Mike? Mike's the number one salesperson in the country. And if you don't believe me, ask Mike, right? <laughs> That's an old joke, but it gets better. So now Mike and um, uh, I have been working together since 1988. And uh, he's on our team locally, so he will out of doubt help you double your business, so help more people and help your business grow. So I'll give you a quick outline of today's events. If you need anybody, uh, you need anything, ask us in the back. We're here to help you guys, okay? So Dr. Wald is not going to uh, take any breaks, so put your seatbelt on. He's going to go from 10 a.m. to noon, okay? And then we're going to take a break from 12 to 1. Free healthy food is provided right here, so you don't have to go anywhere. And at 1 o'clock, we start up with part two, and we go to about 3 o'clock today, all right? You have a uh, backpack on your chair. That's for you. And everything you see in front of you is yours, free, including Super Shake, which is a vegan. This is Cinnamon Swirl, so a really nice, unique flavor, free for you guys to have. So we have a very special speaker. He actually did a seminar with me in Metagenics uh, almost 20 years ago already, right? And uh, I've been chasing him around the last five years to do more business with us. And he always would say, well, why do you want to meet with me? I'm not going to do any more business. So I said, okay, but I'll call I you anyway. I texted that to him. I shouldn't have done it. <laughs> Leave me alone. True. But at least he's up front, right? So then finally, the last text was, hey, would you like all my business? I was like, so I dropped the phone, picked it up, and it says, yes, I'm coming to meet with you myself in New York. So we're really excited because he didn't only want to do the products, but he wanted to speak with us. So he's going to be hopefully heading up. We can finalize our agreement. He's going to be heading up the leadership on our education and all of our speaking. So he's doing webinars, seminars, and uh, I call it Alphabet Soup because if you look behind his name, I know what DC is. That's an easy one. I know what MD is, but the CNS, Certified Nutrition Specialist, and uh, some of the other ones, I wasn't sure how to look them up. So he's been doing this for almost 30 years. He's a leader in what we call functional medicine. He has the best of both worlds with the chiropractic, the CCN, and the MD. And uh, he's been working with uh, me on and off for the last 20 years. So let's uh, give a nice warm welcome to Dr. Michael Wald. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Well, appreciate it. Well, good morning, everyone. And it's a real pleasure to be here. And, and Jamie's right. He's telling the truth. I did text him, please leave me alone. I'm not going to buy any more of your products because he kept sending me texts. And basically what he was doing was just checking in on me because I was using some of the products and, uh, and, and they, were, they were fabulous. And then, uh, you know, just results kept happening and, you know, you get impressed with products. And I say, maybe I should look over that catalog a little bit better. And then I looked it over. I started to expand and I was just super impressed with the, the quality control, with the, with the support that I was getting and also with the integrity of the products themselves. So I've lectured for a lot of companies what Jamie did not say is that I basically begged him for this job. I wanted very much to lecture for this particular company. So again, thank you, Jamie, and, and the rest of the team. They've all been great to me. So now let's get into the seminar. As you know, the topic today is Autoimmune Nutrition Clinic. But before I start getting into the, uh, the, the structured course, I just wanted to ask you all what it is you're here for so that we can make this your own, because this is about how you're treating and how you're managing your patients, probably your own health as well. I know it is for me. So just um, you know, feel free just to raise a hand. Give me an idea. What are you here for? Did I see? Yes, sir. I would like John. to uh, have uh, 
Cut, cut all your hair off, John? I'm sorry, what? Uh, no, I'm kidding. Or that will uh, uh, be like a food product mm -hmm. instead of synthetic uh, okay. ingredients. Okay, so we'll have a conversation about the, the food product aspect of uh, formulations today. We definitely will do that. That's integral to autoimmunity, which is involved in all aging, really. Aging itself is an autoimmune disease. As we break down, we become unlike ourselves cellularly, and then our own immune systems attack our cells. This is a vicious cycle. And when it comes to food-based products or um, more uh, non-food-based products, they, they have a role. So thank you, John. What else? Any particular condition? Yes. Just want to learn how to help our autoimmune patients. Um, you're picking one, I mean, Hashimoto's. Is Hashimoto's, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Hashimoto's is absolutely autoimmune hypothyroidism is part of today's seminar, as is hyperimmune. I'm sorry, hyperthyroidism or Graves' disease and, and lupus, along with MS and diabetes. Even autoimmune aspects of cardiovascular disease, plus others, we'll be covering today. Anything else? Multiple sclerosis. Yeah, MS there. That's a big one for me. Um, I was diagnosed with MS when I was 18 years old, so I know everything there is to know about MS. I mean, and uh, the reason why I wanted to do an autoimmune seminar and why you know, Jamie was so gracious to allow me to do this particular topic is partly, I think, because of that experience. So I have a very large practice in uh, New York, um, and I treat quite a lot of autoimmune and a good deal of, of MS, so we'll be talking about that. And remember, although some of you may not have a particular interest in you know, hyperthyroidism or even MS, and it's some other aspect of autoimmunity, it's, uh, it's related. So there's gold in each of those conditions that relate to others, which is what I'll outline in terms of the fundamental nutritional needs that underline really all repair, okay? So try not to, to chime out if a condition is discussed that is really what you think you're not here for. I would ask you to, to listen today as if your, your life depended on it. Because I know that's what I do. It's a little game I play with myself. So when I, I read something or I, or I, I, I attend a seminar, I, I pretend that my life depends on it. And you know what happens? I listen very differently than if I'm just chiming out. Okay, because uh, there's a lot of good information here today, if I, if I do say so myself. Yes? <laughs> Would you go into depth on T3 and T4 and if the nutritional supplement is capable to do Graves' disease and Hashimoto's? Yes, that's part of the seminar. Thank you, John. Yeah, and the answer is yes. So are we done here? No, okay, yes. Yes, please. Uh, just non-drug interventions. Yes, so we're talking about non-drug interventions, except if some of you have questions about the, the drug interventions of what we do. I was just speaking with, with Eli. Where are you, Eli? There he is. And we were talking in the back about a hyperthyroidism, and we talked about how that's traditionally treated by either ablating and or removing part or all of the thyroid, the person becomes hypothyroid, then they put them on synthroid, then they're all over the place, or they use a drug called methimazole, which is a thyroid blocker. So it's good to know the traditional treatments because some of them can give you, uh, I'm sorry, the medical treatments because some of them can actually give you nutritional ideas. You know, so if you understand the mechanism, let's say, of how methimazole works by blocking the thyroid receptor, let's say, well, milk thistle also does that. And you don't hear that every day, but it's true. Okay, we'll just take maybe two more. Anyone else? Okay. I hope you don't mind if during the talk I also integrate some practice management type of things. Is that okay? And the reason is if you don't keep the patients around, you can't help them. So we need to think of, it's, it can't just be about you being excellent at nutrition because uh, people, you know how they get sometimes, they have lives and uh, they should stay around, but if there is not the structure to keep patients engaged, then you lose them. Not to mention, if you keep them around, that's good for them, and it's good for you. you clinically, you do better work, and financially, you do better as well. Which, like for example, if I did not do well financially, I'm just being frank, I, I, couldn't, um, I, I couldn't be here. I mean, I, I love Jamie, but he's not paying me that much, you know what I'm saying? So uh, the point is that uh, you know, I, I, I structured my practice so that I can do this to educate myself and then have the, uh, you know, the pleasure of uh, engaging with you. Okay? We're good for now? Okay, well, hopefully this will work. 
There we go. So I'm dedicating this uh, seminar to my parents because they always encouraged me to, to do my best, always there for me. My father was a doctor of chiropractic, and uh, he's, they're not here anymore. And uh, he was also a nutritionist way back when, when Colton Fredericks in New York was big. He was like one of the original guys. And I would, um, I would clean my dad's office. I wanted to be around him and what he did so much because it was fascinating to me. And he would teach me about the spine, and we would practice nutrition, and his patients would tell me how no one else helped him, you know. So I just I wanted to clean his office, so he'd pay me, and I would do that, and uh, it was great. So I had a lot of years of, of that. So our focus during this seminar will be the following. We'll be talking about the relationship between allergy and immunity, because, or autoimmunity, because when your body's breaking down, there's histamine release. So breaking, breaking down in autoimmunity is an allergy. It is an allergy. Cardiovascular autoimmune aspects, celiac disease and non-celiac and uh, gluten intolerance, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, which are the inflammatory bowel diseases, diabetes type 2, hypothyroidism and Graves' disease, which is one form of hyper, MS, rheumatoid arthritis. And remember, if there's other immune conditions you're thinking of that are not there, this information can likely apply. If your patients are on particular drugs, there may be drug nutrient interactions that you need to be wary of. Okay? So this is a study uh, regarding the gastrointestinal manifestations of basically all autoimmune diseases. Even when your patients think they don't have GI problems, they do. Okay? So in, a, in an autoimmune disease, the immune system attacks and harms the body's own tissues. That's obvious, right? The systemic autoimmune diseases include, I won't go over these, but just a bunch of other ones. It's just a lot of them. There are over uh, 80 specified autoimmune diseases, and of course, subgroups of those, and then subgroups of those depending on the person's unique expression of the condition, right? No two MS patients are alike. No two lupus patients are alike. No two thyroid patients are alike, okay? So we start with basic nutrition protocols and lifestyle protocols, and then we need to um, identify unique factors in that patient to then modify yet further, okay? Because what else distinguishes you, number one, let's be selfish for a second, from another practitioner? If you know how to personalize, if you are not giving lip service to biochemical individuality and nutritional uniqueness, you are different. You're not only different, you're, you're better. You actually are better. So autoimmune disorders uh, can involve any part of the gastrointestinal tract, the liver, the pancreas. They can cause a variety of GI manifestations, but a lot of times the GI manifestations in autoimmune disease, there's a fancy term for this, it's, it's fascinating to me, they call them extra-intestinal. They're outside the gut. So anything else other than the gut can still be a GI manifestation, okay? When in doubt, just always treat the, the gut because 70% of the immune system in the body is in the small intestine, in the walls, in the pyrus patches. Uh, patients are fascinated to know that. So when you treat the gut, that's how you explain to a person, we need to work on your immune system, right? Yes, of course, so we need to treat your gut because they're thinking, why am I on probiotics? You know, and that's because that helps establish a better ecology and milieu in, in the gut. And of course, that translates to further areas, uh, helping immune mo modification, okay? So probiotics, for example, they're, they're actually adaptogens as well. Meaning if you have hyperimmunity, it tends to come down. If you have hypoimmunity, it tends to regulate this way. But no single nutrient most of the time is going to act as an adaptogen. You, need, you usually need synergism, right? That's why people need to be, patients need to be on multiple nutrients in autoimmune disease. One thing is not going to make the whole difference, or even two or three things. So um, there's a wide variety of GI manifestations from autoimmune diseases, including oral ulcers, dysphagia, esophageal reflux disease can be autoimmune. Okay, abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, fecal incontinence, the list goes on and on. So um, from this particular immunological journal too, they just uh, are talking more about the leaky gut scenario. So when I explain this to patients, uh, which is practically everyone, because I do uh, leaky gut urinary profiles for patients so I can prove to them that they actually have this thing, or I might look under a, a dark field microscope and you can actually see organisms. So those organisms most likely came from one of two main places. One is the gut, the bugs leaking out through a leaky, you know, small intestine. So the small intestine lining comes together and there are tight junctions, right? They should be nice and tight. But with autoimmune disease and breakdown, breakdown of anything, you have this spreading. So the tight junction loses its integrity and that is caused by inflammation and causes inflammation and screws up the mucosal 
the, the gut associated mucosal barriers, um, and you have a leakiness of, of toxins. I mean, it's a real thing, a real thing. I think you might have lost some sound while that's uh, being worked on. Sorry about that. So important to connect the gut uh, to the patient's autoimmune uh, concerns and treat it. And um, how many of you do testing uh, of some type? Blood work, anyone? Okay. Uh, or some type of other testing other than blood work? Okay. The reason why that's probably a good idea because as good as you are, you're going to be better if you do some reliable testing in addition. You're just going to be better. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll go past this. So uh, we're going in the wrong direction. My apologies. You don't want to start all over again, right? <laughs> uh, so um, a couple of concepts here. Number one is uh, introducing products to patients because we're going to talk about a lot of different uh, products today. So um, patients have to understand how the products relate to them. So if they're sitting with you and they have uh, you know, multiple sclerosis or arthritic pain and you're talking about the use of, let's say, uh, you know, folic acid for heart disease, whew, you know, it's just not that. So you need to always introduce products to patients and talk to them about how it relates to them. Uh, also, it's good to have products around in your office so patients see them. You know, as soon as I put like CBD oil on the count, just on the counter in my office two weeks ago when I started using it, it's like, it's gone. You know, it's just gone. I mean, I, I, they won't even like say no, like they want it. So if it's out there enough, that's good. So people will start asking you questions. Autoimmune laboratory tests, we're gonna talk a lot about testing today. Now, if you don't do lab tests, if you don't do blood work, that's okay. But you might wanna ask your patients for blood work. Because if you get that blood work, we're going to talk about, you're going to know a lot of lab by the end of the day. And the nutritional applications of lab to your patients, okay? And, they, and they're going to love it when you, uh, when you actually can change these abnormal labs. So if you're sitting with a patient, let's say you're a nutritionist, you don't have license to order blood, you can say, um, I would like you to give this letter to your primary doctor, which will say something like, you know, dear doctor, on behalf of that mutual patient, I would appreciate if you would perform the following uh, laboratory tests to assist me in their nutritional care. I mean, if they say no to that, that's pretty sad. Uh, and sometimes they do. But usually you get the labs. You can also charge for an interpretation. Uh, that is your time. And uh, you can do better at nutritional work. Um, I also have a software. Uh, we'll spend just a little time on that. And I have sample uh, reports here. They're called blood detective reports. So it's a software program. You put the results of your patient's blood work in the system. It medically and nutritionally interprets the lab. Uh, it tells you the, the compounds, the nutritional compounds to give. It gives you dietary work based on the biochemical uniqueness of the patient. So it's basing nutritional recommendations on accepted uh, evidence-based science, which are lab tests. And uh, you want to use autoimmune questionnaires or different types of questionnaires for patients, particularly when they start, when you start losing them, you know, not responding. Say, listen, I hope all's well. Fill out this form. And it's hard for people not to fill out a questionnaire. Particularly if it has to do with weight loss, but let, let's be real. If it's autoimmune, send that one. So you're not saying, I haven't seen you in a while, come on in. You're saying, hi, hi Joe, come on, you know, it's nice seeing you, I hope everything's going well. Please complete this, it'll help us catch up. So it's a nice, soft way of re-engaging people. Not to mention, you see their scores go down on the autoimmune questionnaire. I have lots of different questionnaires that I use, in them, and those uh, practitioners that I do consulting work with, they get all of my questionnaires. And then um, supplement lists with dosages and disclaimers. So when you give supplements to a patient, just from a medical legal point of view, how many of you have nutrition malpractice? No? One? OK, well, that's about average. Um, you know, how many of you are doing well in practice? OK, not, okay let's assume you're all doing well. You want to keep what you're making? You better get some nutritional malpractice. It's not expensive. But you want to have it. We're, we're in a litigious society. But I um, mention this because supplement lists, so you might have your Nutritional Frontier supplement lists, everything's there, and you might have even doses there where you can check off boxes quickly to very, very quickly produce a supplement list for a patient, and at the bottom, you have them sign a disclaimer. You know, I've, I've been involved in cases where I was an expert witness on where practitioners gave a dose different than what's on the bottle, and that was considered um, improper. So you have to write in your disclaimer that you know, the dose on the bottle may differ from that, I, that, that is you know, uh, recommended to you, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to have your disclaimers in place, and you want to have some malpractice insurance, because you want to do this stuff for a long time. OK. 
laboratory. So with autoimmune disease, we want to look at white blood cell counts. Uh, some autoimmune conditions will result, have a, a higher white blood cell count. And it usually is a neutrophil count, which tends to be more bacterial or nonspecific inflammation. And uh, the white blood cell count could also be elevated uh, because of um, you know, viral components, obviously, and that, that would have the lymphocytes being the cause of the elevated white blood cell count. And then a lot of people with autoimmune have chronically uh, abnormal um, white blood cell counts. They'll have a high neutrophil count and a low lymphocyte count. You'll see that, and that usually means chronic uh, infection and or inflammation or past. But they're left with that, that wasted immune system, you know, because it's there. Uh, uh, other doctors might say, oh, no, that's because of a past infection that left this person compromised. And that's where we step in with the nutrition. Then uh, the CBC, which is the complete blood count, which is, of course, the white blood cell count, is part of the complete blood count. And then specific aspects of the lab, MCV and MCH. I'm just going to use the MCV as an example, mean corpuscular <coughs> volume. So what you'll find in a lot of people is they'll be high or high normal uh, mean corpuscular volume. So the average size of the red blood cell, the mean corpuscular volume, the average size of the corpuscle's volume is enlarged. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Does anyone know a reason or two why a red blood cell might be enlarged? It'll, sh it'll show as a high normal or normal MCV or under a microscope, you just see big cells. Yes? Yes, more specific? <coughs> and? Oh, oh, that's folic acid. You, you almost fooled me. Yes, B6, B12, folic acid, vitamin C, E, and B1, roughly in that order for large cells. Cholesterol over 300. Uh, chemotherapy will do that. But uh, when you see that, it's sort of like the cell is becoming deficient, so it's getting larger, saying, see me, see me. So the cell is here, and then in the serum, that might be deficient or even normal, even high levels of B vitamins. This is what doctors miss all the time. They'll have normal or high levels of B12. And they'll say, stop the B12. <laughs> they sound just like that, stop. And uh, when the B12 cannot get into the red blood cell, the B12 is either normal or it's high because it's not getting in. So they say, stop taking it, but it's not in the cell. So the patient's suffering from cellular B12 deficiency. They have all the signs of not enough. So when you give them activated folic acid, activated B12, activated B6, which is the only stuff that Nutritional Frontier uses, that's going to help methylation inside that red blood cell. The red blood cell is going to shrink. It's going to carry oxygen better. It's going to live longer. And if you have big fat blood cells floating around, that's like f f increased viscosity of blood, which you'll find in all the autoimmune conditions. Okay? I wish we could talk on this more. But see, when you do the blood detective reports, it tells you all of this relative to all the findings. It interpolates it, and it says, here's what you need to think about. Guys, it, I mean, I've been, I developed that program over 20 years. It knows more than I know. C-reactive protein, you can hear that uh, a lot. Uh, so CRP is uh, the most sensitive inflammatory marker that you can actually measure. It shows up earlier than the more common inflammatory marker, which is ESR. Have you heard of ESR, right? S or SED rate, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. So what happens in autoimmune diseases, the red blood cells stick, 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 stick. And then the test tube in the lab, they stick, and then they, when they're inflamed, got to lose a little weight here. Uh, when they're inflamed, they, they sink to the bottom faster. So the erythrocyte sedimentation rate is increased in inflammatory conditions. So that's what you'll see. And omega-3 fatty acids and curcumin with piperine and vitamin C and fish oils and vitamin D help unstick all of that. Okay. Ferritin uh, is an inflammatory marker. It's also a marker of too much iron storage. But most of the time, it's not from too much iron storage when it's elevated. It's from inflammation. So um, all of the things we're speaking about today that manage inflammation very effectively lower ferritin e every time. I've never seen it not work. So um, any questions on ferritin or the lab so far? Um, does a chronic low ferritin have anything to do with autoimmune? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. So ferritin is the storage protein of iron in the liver. So it's iron-bound protein. So two things happen in autoimmune diseases. There is protein wasting. The person wastes, they become sarcopenic. They lose protein, so the ferritin is not produced as much. Ferritin gets low. And then if the ferritin protein is low, 
you can't bind to iron and or the person is um, malabsorbing iron. So you'll commonly see a protein anemia in autoimmune and an iron anemia in autoimmune. There are over a dozen types of anemias. By the way, I have a radio show every Saturday, which is uh, also posted on my blog on my website. And I did a show called um, uh, The Anemias, or uh, what did I call it? Something like, em oh, I called it Empty Blood Disease because I just wanted people to be curious about it. So um, I made that up. So, but the truth is there is like over a dozen different anemias. So to answer your question, you'll see low iron. Uh, and if you see ferritin low, you know that the iron loss is chronic. Okay, it's chronic when you see low iron, as opposed to iron. Serum iron is not a good marker for, for iron storage because it only represents the iron floating around in the plasma for a couple of days. But ferritin is a few months, okay? Yes? Can you differentiate CRP versus cardio CRP? Yeah, basically um, they're the same, except someone owns one and not the other, uh, and it's a kind of a legal thing, but the ranges are different. That's the only difference. <laughs> so um, the C-reactive protein, cardio, is considered the better one because its range on this end on the low side is lower. So when inflammation happens, it's picked up sooner than the C-reactive protein standard test, which starts over here. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Same thing with nutritional homocysteine and homocysteine. Same test. Okay. So homocysteine methylmalonic acid, very quickly, they are functional tests of B vitamin use. They are functional. Not just how much blood is, uh, nutrients are floating around, B6, B12, folic acid. You can have normal levels of those B vitamins. If you, know, if you want to know if the person is using those B vitamins, you check homocysteine. And if you're really good, you check homocysteine and methylmalonic acid because homocysteine is better for folic acid and methylmalonic acid is better for B12, but homocysteine is pretty good. If you just did that, that'd be pretty good. You want homocysteine to be a seven. Everyone with autoimmune disease has the potential to have low values of, I'm sorry, high values, high values of, of one or both homocysteine and methylmalonic acid. So you know your dosing is correct when you bring them down at least into the normal range and meta-analysis says seven is the optimal range. In the blood detective software, I only have optimal ranges. So if you compare people's labs to my healthy ranges, they're gonna have many more abnormalities, but they're gonna show a different story. So then you apply nutrition that way. Uh, question? Yeah, you like. Yeah, um, you're the first person in 20 years that's asked me that question. Good for you. So low homocysteine maybe it seems to be associated with osteoporosis and osteopenia. But so is heart disease. Yeah, both low and high homocysteine are associated with cardiovascular disease. And you can look that up on PubMed. PubMed is the national, um, um, it's a national database, one of the, the two. Uh, library, national Library of Medicine a database. Goes back from 1966 into the present. It's got a little bar there. You put in low homocysteine and boom, there you got it. Have all the evidence, it's, it's incredible. So all the information I'm telling you today is evidence-based. Okay, and then of course each autoimmune disease may have their unique abnormalities. Lupus might have an, an ANA antibody high, but then again, ANA, anti-nuclear antibody, is a non-specific autoimmune test. So um, as any rheumatologist would tell you, that um, anyone could have it high and they'll never have a problem. But like all tests, the meaning of the test is always relative to the patient. So, you know, if someone's getting heart attacks all the time and their homocysteine's elevated, it's probably related. Rather than some cardiologist telling you, oh, well, the studies on homocysteine uh, and heart disease, they're not true anymore. They're actually saying this now because another study comes out that says no, but you always want to consider the predominance, uh, uh, predominance of the evidence. What does it mostly say? And then what does it mean with that person? Okay, how are we doing? Okay, good. So um, I was saying that each uh, autoimmune disease may have some uniquenesses, like anti-citrulline antibody tends to be the best test for rheumatoid arthritis, not rheumatoid factor, as you might think. Okay. And then there's total protein in the labs. So total protein, as the word would tell you, total is the total of two things, albumin and globulin. So if someone, usually with autoimmune disease, there's protein overuse. And then the body 
steals protein from other areas to try to manage this inflammatory autoimmune degenerative stress. And that's called protein stealing. So whey protein would be the best of all the proteins to help offset uh, protein stealing. And uh, I like to base the, the dosing on either the patient's tolerance, uh, as much as they can take, or, and then, you know, if they have GI upset, then you back off. It's like a tolerance test. Or uh, you can start with what's on the label, but that's just a generalized thing. Or I'll base it on their um, kilogram of uh, body weight of lean mass. So I'll do uh, bio, uh, body composition in every patient. So does anyone else here do uh, bioimpedance testing, body composition? Okay, one person. So you've heard of biomarkers. So biomarkers are tests by definition. If you manage them well, the patient lives longer and better. Um, so homocysteine is a biomarker, C-reactive protein is a biomarker. The reason I mention that is because the number one biomarker that exists is body composition, meaning that if you want to predict someone's morbidity and mortality from, from dying of anything, it's body composition is the best predictor. You can do those tests, which you should, because if you improve lean body mass on a person with autoimmune disease or any disease, you've done them well. Okay? And the tests are not expensive to do. And, they, and patients love it because once you mention to them that you're also testing their percentage of protein, you know, uh, fat and water, they're like, fat, fat? And then they, they want to do it. <laughs> but, uh, and then it tells you the amount of water in and outside of cells too, which is another biomarker of morbidity. Okay. So then there's, I mentioned a few others, IgM, immunoglobin M, immunoglobin G, immunoglobin E, right, immunoglobin A. We've heard of some of these or all of these. So immunoglobin A is the most abundant, A for abundant, just made that up, in the intestinal tract. It's in the mucous membrane of the gut. So anything you do to improve the leakiness of the gut and the colon will improve immunoglobin A. Zinc is important for that. A is important for that. D is important for that. Glutamine, aloe vera. Glyceritic acid, glycerin, there's other things as well. Um, IgM can increase with, um, in autoimmune disease, also in um, uh, certain cancers like multiple myeloma and, and something called Waldenstrom's uh, macroglobulinemia. And then you have, so autoimmune disease is too much of a good thing, which patients really don't understand. So I say, you know, your immune system is hyperactive, like, oh, really? Yeah. So it's, it's consuming nutrition and it's consuming it at a rate that's faster than the repair. So when the degenerative process, I tell patients, is exceeded by the repair process, we have this, okay? Hyporesponsiveness, there's low, immune, uh, low immunity as well. And, and a person could have low immunity along with hyperimmunity because we have basically three immune systems. So um, we have our cell-mediated immune system where cells mediate the immune response. And then we have the immunoglobins, which is the humoral immune system. And then there's the complement immune system. And as the word would tell you, it complements the balance between the cell-mediated and the humoral, or the immunoglobin immune system. So um, that's what this last statement is talking about. Hyper and hyper-responsiveness is overactive. Above that, hypo-responsiveness. And I don't really bother checking complement immune systems. Okay. So we know that autoimmune triggers are many. Genetics obviously can predispose a person. And also um, extreme prolonged physical uh, and or emotional stress will reduce the immune system. We know that athletes and runners, like I'm a runner, runners tend to have more upper respiratory infections than most of the population because it decreases immunity. So it also increases uh, nutritional needs. That may be one of the reasons why it does that. So you have to try to balance that out with your patients. So, Extreme exercise is like cancer, because it's all uh, just consuming. So they're treated very much similarly. Hormonal deficiencies can trigger the immune system. Food allergies can trigger an inflammatory cascade. So that's a big deal, because if someone's immune system is characterized by, let's say, high immunoglobin G, and you know some of you have done food allergy tests where you're measuring a food immunoglobin G test, if you trigger that, it's like putting a spark onto that so you have an allergy stimulating an immune response. Something that the rheumatologists never think about. And they don't talk to the, the uh, allergy people. Very strange. Heavy metal burden obviously is going to trigger autoimmunity and, on, and metals disrupt hormones. Radiation exposure, 
uh, contrast material exposure from you know, um, imaging, uh, a diet high in refined and processed foods and carbohydrates, hydrogenated fats, trans fats, alcohol, tobacco, all these things you would think, medications, including antibiotics, infections, getting sick from something like a cold can trigger a whole immune response. It could be a, a, a subtle thing. It could be a lot of subtle things that add up. And then the person's trying to figure out the one food they ate in the last two days. And they're like, I think it was that one. And I, have you heard this? You know, it has nothing to do with that. But don't tell them because they won't believe you in the leaf. So sometimes you just have to say, OK, maybe, and you know, go through it. Yes, sir? So what kind of test can you do uh, that's positive for the heavy metals? OK, great question. So I do blood and urine heavy metals. Um, and uh, you could do cell, cell membrane metals, but that's very costly. That would tell you sort of what's like in a tissue of a red blood cell, not necessarily a brain cell. And then there's the plasma or serum levels, and then there's the urine. So there's no single best test. So I do two of the three. I do uh, urine, as I mentioned, and I do uh, blood. And if I see someone that has um, you know, metals in their urine, that's, that's great. They're eliminating things, but they may also have a high level in the blood. I like to see both the blood and urine void of metals two or three times before I say, OK, for now we're good with the metal chelation and or health improvements that we've done. OK? 24-hour provocation, everyone's going to be positive on those tests. I don't do them for that reason because we're all exposed to metals. If you take a chelator, they're going to come out. And I, if I'm going to use a chelator, I'm going to use N-acetylcysteine. That's like in the top three, I think, of my favorite supplements of all time. NAC um, increases, well, it's a chelator, meaning, does everyone know what chelation is? Chelation is a process of binding to a toxin, like a metal. And NAC produces glutathione in the body, which is a tripeptide immune modulator. And um, the longer-lived animals have more glutathione. And it's antiviral, it's antifungal, it's antiparasitic. And what am I missing? Oh, it's a mucolytic agent, breaks up mucus. And it's also a drug. It's called mucomist. They use it for cystic fibrosis. So it's got tremendous utility, tremendous utility. Just don't give it with zinc or copper or other metals within 30 minutes because it will bind to them. Not all of them, but it can affect it. OK? Did that answer your question, John, I hope? Yeah. OK, good. All right. Next. So immunological review talking here about short-chain fatty acids produced in the gut uh, with fiber. Um, fiber is very important in autoimmunity because fiber is acted on by the intestinal bugs and or uh, the uh, probiotics that you're giving the patient exogenously in the form of supplementation. And there are short-chain fatty acids that are produced. Uh, butyric acid and caprylic acid are the two main ones and they exit the bowel. And they do a lot of corrective work all over the body. They don't simply just repair the lining. They modify the immune system and do that at distant sites as well. So fiber is not just fiber. Soluble fiber uh, is particularly important, but uh, certainly soluble and insoluble uh, both play a role. What yes, James. And caprylic. Don't ask me to spell it. <laughs> That's my weakness. Can't spell. Um, we are going in the wrong direction. Okay, I'll get this right. OK, here we go. So this is just uh, one of the top page of one of my blood detective reports. So I run these reports on every patient about every three months. And just a practice management little tidbit here. I charge $125 for this report. The report can be a little thinner. The report can be thicker. I n almost never print these reports. Although I always have a sample around to show them it is real, I, I send them as PDFs that are encrypted when I email them. And then I will uh, show them the results on a, um, on a monitor on my desk. And I'll say, this is how, these are your results over here. These are your blood results. This is how you compare to average people. So you have abnormalities, but you have a lot more abnormalities when I compare you to, to healthy. Why not compare you to healthy? Let's shoot for healthy, I say, because maybe we'll get you here. If we shoot for average, we might get you there. So who wouldn't want to do that? You know? So um, I call those functional ranges. And they're based on literature reviews that I've done over a couple of decades already. 
And then this is another page that I show them where on the left it has their weak body systems. The, the body systems are weak relative to the number of abnormal tests that blood detective determines are abnormal compared to both a, uh, average ranges and healthy. So I will ask, I will default the blood detective settings to give the nutritional compound suggestions, which you can then extrapolate to the frontiers nutrients, and also food suggestions in the form of 10-day breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack food plans based on the chemistry of the patients, based on the number of abnormal labs they have. And then over time, when I repeat these, the list gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then the, then the emphasis on foods and nutrients changes as their chemistry changes. Not, okay, here's a supplement, see ya. But they, your patients, mostly think that way. They actually think that when you give them what you give them, that's what they need, which it changes. Their doses change. You know, my son is a, is a bodybuilder, one of my sons, and uh, he stopped growing. You know, I, I think at this point he couldn't fit through the side of the, so he says, how come I'm not, what can I do differently? He says, everything, this is what, I'm doing the same thing I've always done. I'm like, yes, that's why it's not working. You're bigger now, you need more protein. Then I went from there. So people's needs must change, and you need to tell your patients that many times. Okay, questions? Input? Okay, so quiet. All right, <laughs> quiet's good. And this is a page where it just lists the supplements uh, for that particular patient's chemistry. And this is a listing of the different dietary plans that some that are in the blood detective system that would be prescribed based on the number of abnormal tests. So for example, in the functional range over there, the the, there's more abnormal tests, number nine abnormal tests, that suggest that this person needs a high protein diet. Now, if, we can't, if I can't convince them to improve their diet, then I'm going to work with what I can with their diet, and then I'm going to augment with supplementation. And with, with autoimmune disease, you have to use supplementation. So people say to me, well, why nutrients? Can't, wh why that and not? Can't we do it through a balanced diet? I don't even know what that means. And the balanced diet in the autoimmune universe is changing constantly, mm -hmm. right? So we have to change with that. That's why your patients need to realize they need to be uh, exposed to you with consultations. So when I meet with people with these concerns, I put them on, you know, I might um, suggest, let's say, 12 consultations over a six-month period or whatever it is relative to them so I have the proper exposure. And you don't have to know everything you think you need to be the one talking all the time. They all have plenty of input, <laughs> and there's a lots to do. Because you'll find, you know, you'll sit with someone three or four times, and they'll say something that, is so fundamental that you realize, wow, I really need, need to sit with this person. Like I was sitting with someone a, a couple weeks ago that I've been seeing for, I'm embarrassed to say, about eight years, and she says to me, Dr. Will, do you think that stress has anything to do with my autoimmune disease? I'm like, uh, maybe. <laughs> Didn't we cover that three years ago? So it's everyone needs that. Yes? Did you have them pay for the 12 months? In, a, in, advance. in advance. Yeah, I have a cash practice. Okay. I get just cash. Uh, well, not just like money with presidents on them, but you know, checks and things like that. I don't accept insurance, but I have uh, super bills that are automat automated and generated for patients, and um, that's what I do. Yeah, mostly if depending on how people hear about you, it's very easy for you to get them enrolled. So I just did this public lecture at these libraries where I live. I decided to, to do that, having not done a lot of public speaking in a bit, and um, those people when they called, it was like. Just getting them on a schedule was super easy, and when I told them what they needed after an initial consultation, a long conversation, a couple of hours, they were like, oh, yeah, of course I need to set this up, and if I do that, then I'll know I have to be here, and then I'll have it structured, and I'll have the proper support. It just works for everyone. If you don't do it, it's really, you're really the problem, you know. It's like when I first started practicing, I was very uh, shy about money and that whole thing, and all that did was just... I just lost opportunities with people, you know, but now I, I put that aside, and I'll even admit to them, if I'm in an uncomfortable place, say, listen, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable talking about money, but you owe me 10 grand. <laughs> I need it yesterday, okay? So um, sometimes that's what's needed, okay? Well, yeah? Uh, roughly, so every three months, and also, of course, thanks to you for bringing that up, it depends on the abnormality in the patient and what you're doing. So, for example, if someone's C-reactive protein cardio is abnormal, you must redo that test in two weeks. That's the protocol. 
I always see it done wrong, but you want to do that because it can vary quite a bit. You need to see what range they're in. So for example, the same thing is true with uh, blood pH. So I did this show called pH lies because there's so much misunderstanding about pH, right? Acid-base balance. So a patient will say to me, oh, should I be alkaline with autoimmune disease? I'm like, I don't know what that means. What do you think that means? Well, I, it, shouldn't I be like alkaline? Well, you should be alkaline in your mouth, so those enzymes work. You should be acid in your stomach, right? You should be alkaline in your small intestine. You should be slightly acid in your colon. You should be slightly acid in your urine. Your blood should be just to the left of neutral. So being alkaline, you'd be dead. So no, no. So, um, but it is true that if someone is on the acidic side, that that will promote inflammation, no doubt. So I measure blood pH. I don't measure urine and saliva pH unless I'm dealing with a UTI in a woman, then I need to know what her, or a man, what the urine pH is. And that's why acidophilus and probiotics work so well for UTIs. You can cure them nearly 75% of the time just with the right probiotics because of acidophilus. The UTIs happen in the alkaline pH, so you have to make the urine more acid. And you can do it with acidophilus. Isn't that great how you name these things? So I measure pH in the office, and I'm able to repeat those tests often enough, um, and I charge also for packages of retesting in advance, as much as I can. Okay? So again, just a little prom promo. With my, with my uh, consulting work, uh, I set practices up for all of this stuff, like overnight, what, I, what took me decades to do. The evaluation report is the long report. And those separate pages I showed you before are taken out and summarized in bullet form. And I would go over this report over several consultations. And I'd re-go re over it again with patients, uh, showing them how they compare to healthy, et cetera, so they get it. It's not just one time. It's not just one report done. You did a report. Thank you very much. You want to educate people like no one else is doing. When I say to a patient, I'm going to write the book on you, no, really, I, I'm, I'm going to write the book on you, they get it, and uh, that works. Okay, let's speed up. Supplement concepts. So this is really important. Recommended dosages on the supplement container is one way to start. You adjust your supplements based upon patient tolerance. Now, they say to you, Dr. Wald, I didn't come back for two weeks. I'm mad at you. Like, what did I, what, what happened? Well, I took that vitamin C buffered capsules that you have and I got diarrhea. Well, we did talk about that and that's actually supposed to happen. But you didn't tell me about the gas. So, you know, you gotta uh, adjust to people and you have to be on your toes. So if something like that happens, you don't say, oh my God, I'm sorry. Because <laughs> it's, you know, I'm not saying lie, but you know, learn from it and then adjust, that's all. You wouldn't, you don't just throw something out the window just because it had an intolerance. They sometimes think that way, okay? It's like a psych, you know, a practice is like mostly psychology, right? When you think about it. <laughs> Every once in a while, a patient will say to me, it's like, you're like a therapist. I'm like, whatever you need. <laughs> I've got my own too. All right, so adjust based on patient response, based on their tolerance, adjust and determine based upon laboratory work. These are all the ways that you can personalize for your autoimmune patients. You compare the patient to average, you compare them to healthy, which is, we did in terms of lab work. Um, maybe based on weak body systems, maybe you'll do a blood detector report, maybe you'll use a technology like that that's outside. There are many ways of, of doing this. So let's talk about uh, Betazine. Before we do, any last question or two just to kind of clean up the initial stuff? Okay, yes. Um, I am aware of some work that did say uh, that there were some subset of people that might respond to increased intraocular pressure from NAC, but the predominance of evidence does not show that. However, if you have a person that has a history of that, you might want to make a judgment. This is part of the individualization process. Um, you can use lipoic acid, vitamin C, calcium, zinc, if they need iron, you give them iron. The minerals displace the metals. Now I know that lipoic acid is not a mineral, but uh, it is a chelator. Um, cysteine, glycine, glutathione, fiber, omega-3 fatty acids allow for metals to come out of cells through a more fluid cell membrane, right, because they're softening everything. 
We, we're born soft, we die stiffs. Anything we can do, <laughs> you know, is a good thing. Lots of oils. Uh, there was a last question here, Eli. What is the max dose of NAC and what dose do you start off at? Okay, so I would start off with about 500 milligrams in an adult. Uh, although if I have a child uh, who is, uh, you know, let's say 10 years and older of normal weight, I'll also use about 500 milligrams. Uh, you can't hurt them. Um, I can't think of, I mean, if you give large doses, GI upset is about all you're really going to get. And it's super effective uh, for removing the metals with, with very few side effects. I'm sorry, Doc? 500 milligrams, is it once a day, twice a day? Well, that's the minimum I would start. But in an adult, I usually, if I have metals that, I'm, that are showing up, I'll use uh, 500 milligrams three times a day because you know, the half-life is just a few hours, so you, you don't want it diving like this. You want it to kind of be here. And then uh, I might increase it to 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. I mean, I take 3,000 a day just for kicks. You know, it's one of the things that is very important in MS. Uh, but for overall health, it's just, um, and we could do a whole seminar on that. One last question before we move ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that question. So the question was, if I increase omega-3s, do I increase omega-6 in a balanced way? The yeah, balance is a very subjective term. Um, so the answer is, I don't. I don't like omega-6s. Personally, I don't like them. They're mostly pro-inflammatory. So, uh, yes? You will find some studies of uh, a few contrary reverse effects of omega-6 saying they're anti-inflammatory. That could be. But overall, omega-3s are anti-inflammatories. They produce prostaglandin E3s. And the omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. They produce the prostaglandin ones. We're going to have to move on. I'm sorry. We can probably integrate more. So beta zyme and a protocol. So I have, I have a protocol for patients where I determine their uh, need for enzymes based on a tolerance test, their need for vitamin C based on a tolerance test, uh, even their omega-3s based on tolerance, magnesium, iodine. So keep in mind that those procedures exist. But beta zyme is one of the most fundamental things that should be in your, in your practice, not to mention just for autoimmune disease. Antibodies that are floating around, number one, can get, they can get uh, digested by enzymes. The enzymes don't just stay in the gut. Some of these make their way out in circulation. They can even help digest cancerous tissues. It's a big deal. And this is all in the literature. They're anti-inflammatory, meaning they're tissue reparative, meaning they offset negative nitrogen balance, which means the lean body mass can come back. Not just muscle mass, but organ mass. So you lose your organ mass, you're old, right? So disease and, and, and autoimmune inflammation just eat that up. Enzymes help off, offset that, not to mention they help you absorb. <laughs> so that's really important. Um, so betaine hydrochloride is, is one of the elements included in this particular product along with pancreatin and gentian root, which is really interesting. So gentian root number one helps to, it's not in the product descriptions, but it helps to regenerate the chief cells and the parietal cells of the stomach, which produce stomach acid. Now, why are we talking about stomach acid? 95% um, of those with autoimmune disease have hypochlorhydria or achlorhydria, where they don't make any stomach acid at all. If you do not make any stomach acid, how are you gonna digest your proteins? How are you going to cleave B12 from proteins in your food? Not that well. How are you going to ionize calcium so that it goes in the bone rather than you take calcium and it goes in the breast tissue giving you calcium-laden breast cysts which cause cancer or the calcium doesn't get managed with hypochlorhydria or achlorhydria so it goes into the arteries causing hardening of the arteries and of course that calcium is leaching out of the bones which is why you have an association between breast cancer, loss of bone density, hardening of the arteries and sometimes neurologic problems, and blood clotting because calcium is needed for blood clotting. So calcium dysmetabolism is a big deal in autoimmunity, and you can't really measure it. You mean you can measure calcium levels. You can even measure ionized calcium levels, but they're not really that useful. It's an assumption, I believe, that you should make that the autoimmune diseases we're talking about today, they are hypochlorhydric because the studies show these things. I used to check stomach acid by putting a, a, a telemetry capsule down someone's throat tied to a string, and I would give them challenge tests. I'd have to pull this out. Half the people would throw up all over the place. Uh, and then I, real, I learned something after three years of cleaning up vomit was that uh, most people are hypochlorhydric, so I stopped doing the test. Lost a lot of income, but that was okay because I was satisfied. 
Just like I don't do fatty acid tests anymore, I don't do amino acid tests anymore, because people need proteins and people need fatty acids, the tests don't change what I do. I will only do testing that changes what I don't think I can guess at better. Um, so this protocol has stomach digesting acids and enzymes and animal-based uh, protein, fat, and starch digesting enzymes. Um, the animal-based enzymes work in a, in a very wide pH scale, which is great. Plant-based enzymes work at a very tight scale. So they're not useless, bromelain and papain, but they're not in the same stratosphere as this is. Okay? So I might give a patient one of these, this is key, one per meal, let's say three times a day, a meal being at least a handful of food, and then if they don't have a whole bunch of symptoms that I have on my list, then the next day they know to take two, three times a day, and if they don't have any of the symptoms on my list, the next day they do three, three times a day, up to six per meal, three times a day. So if they get some of those symptoms, then they know to stop, they can drink some water, they can take an antacid, they let me know what their tolerance was, and then that means intolerance, and then just before that is tolerance, that tells me how much they need each day. As they get better, they'll say, you know, I'm having those symptoms again. I'm like, oh, you need less enzymes, good for you. You know, then people ask me, well, will I be taking enzymes forever? Maybe. Autoimmune disease is a different, different animal. But um, taking the enzymes and acids can give the body a physiologic rest period. The pancreas and the stomach acid, I mean the stomach lining, can uh, make a comeback when you have the enzymes and acids coming from the outside. Does that make sense? We're gonna see if I fly out the door. Okay. okay. Um, dosing again, you can always start with what's on the container and then you move from there. Um, this is basically what I've said just now. This rest effect is the, the phenomenon of body systems um, regenerating by you doing the work for them. And then you slowly can taper off and see how the person does. And if they don't do so well, just go back. Okay. So for autoimmune as allergy and the whole concept of general autoimmunity, there's a couple of fundamental things. We're going to go over these over and over and over again. We want to use the betazyme. Almost everyone needs that. If they have reflux, you still want to give it to them. This will probably cure the reflux because most reflux has to do with too little stomach acid, as I think everyone in here knows, uh, not too much except it is too much in the esophagus, which is why they have symptoms. If they didn't have symptoms of reflux, uh, that means they don't have acid in their esophagus. If they have acid in their esophagus, that means their gastroesophageal valve is open. So chiropractically, we can manipulate that, or maybe through acupuncture, and I was talking to a massage therapist, they did some energy work. There's a lot of ways to deal with it, but we want to close that valve, okay? Anyway, super B complex. The, the B vitamin need of those with any chronic health problem uh, and any healing process will increase the need for B vitamins. Uh, NRDMG or uh, dimethylglycine, among other may, many effects in the body, is an immunomodulator. Um, it's a detoxifier. It, it helps circulation. It's an anti-inflammatory. It helps uh, oxygen utilization. All of these are problems on one level. Uh, I, I do a lot of hyperbaric oxygen with my autoimmune patients, by the way, so side note. Uh, then minerals, um, particularly the alkaline minerals, which you'll find in frontier minerals, uh, they're alkaline, which hopefully will help the pH of that person increase in the normal range. So the normal blood pH is roughly 7.4. So 7.35 to 7.45. If I have someone with uh, seizures, I want their pH to be on the low end of normal. 7.35, maybe even 7.3, because if I give them uh, you know, MCTs, which are found in one of our whey products here, that helps to produce keto acids, which helps increase the seizure threshold, which reduces seizures. So you want those people in a, on the acid end, but you want cancer people and autoimmune people on the alkaline end at about 7.45 to 7.5. If they move much more that direction or move below 7.3, they're in a hospital. We're talking blood, not urine and, and saliva. If I say boo to someone, I could change their saliva and their pH of their urine, but not the blood. Okay. Any questions on that? Input? Comments? Yes. What about type 1 diabetes? What about it? 
Oh, yeah, ketoacidosis problems? Yeah, so you just pretty much brought up the main contraindication of uh, converting someone into, uh, you know, keto acids. They wouldn't want it to do that. Right, don't do it, no. <laughs> it's a no-no, okay? Omega-3, uh, vitamin D. Um, the combination of omega-3 and vitamin D is very interesting. We'll get to it. Um, and then a, pro, a probiotic with an enzyme combination here. Um, people often ask me, well, don't the enzymes destroy the probiotics? And don't stomach acids destroy the probiotics? Not if you have properly produced probiotics. The probiotic um, science behind what Nutritional Frontiers offers, it doesn't get any better. And so the answer is no. Um, no. And the literature that they do have, some extensive literature on their probiotic uh, formulations and the science behind their probiotic production, uh, also reviews that you, don't, you do not have to worry uh, about destroying probiotics if you're giving stomach acids or enzymes, okay? I mean, you, you could, I suppose, if you gave them doses that are ridiculous. That would create a, a level of physiologic pH that I guess nothing could survive in, but uh, just a side note. And the microgon stuff, this I think every single person on the planet should be on. And whey protein, again, particularly important in autoimmune for a number of reasons we will see, including the fact that whey protein can balance immunoglobin levels. Yes? Um, can you substitute in a super shake for the whey for someone who might have like an IgG reaction to dairy? Yes. Okay. Is that Absolutely. going to be as beneficial? Probably. Okay. It's pretty, pretty, pretty uh, complimentary. Was there someone else? I'm sorry. Oh, okay, good. So why are you asking, Lady Ellen? I'm kidding. <laughs> so the idea behind suggesting the whey protein is yeah. just getting another source of protein that's... Okay, digestible. thank you. It's big. Okay, so morbidity, mortality, and autoimmunity, and cancer, uh, and all bad diseases, they have one thing in common. They eat up and steal protein. So yes, one is you want to get that protein in. There's lots of different sources of protein. Maybe you have a vegan patient. We have vegan options here too. But if that's not the case, whey is the, the most studied, I would say, certainly the most studied. Uh, in, um, and again, it's just tremendous, the amount of science behind it. And because it does contain natural immunoglobins, if someone has a high IgG in autoimmunity, which you might say, well, isn't that bad? It is. But when you actually take um, immunoglobins, the body can convert immunoglobins to the other ones and can balance them out. It's a whole complex thing, but uh, that's another very important reason to have whey protein, okay? And generally, people will, who are um, lactose intolerant will tolerate uh, whey protein. If they tell you, if they ask you the question, they probably will react poorly. <laughs> I'm just telling you, that's the psychiatry of these patients. So then you say, well, let's start with a teaspoon, you know, and kind of do that. Thanks. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes. I just find that my clients seem to do better with the whey protein if I have them take the beta zone with it. Yeah. Like, they don't have any problems. Yeah, which makes sense. So if someone has an intolerance mm -hmm. to the, the whey, you have just performed a stomach acid test on them or a pancreatic enzyme test. So you know they need either stomach acids and or pancreatic enzymes if you give them those things and now they have a better tolerance to the product. So if they say to me also about fish oil, oh, when I take it, this and that happens, I give them enzymes, and they're good. You reduce, give them enzymes. Maybe stop for a day, you know, use your common sense.